morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barton, Washington. Today is Monday, March 20th. And here are some of the stories we are covering. South Africa's Economic Freedom Fighters Party calls for a national shutdown today, Monday. South Africans have been uh, almost uh, subjected to rolling blackouts. And the uh, people that the president deployed, and he had also been responsible for that, had actually failed this money. Kenya's Raila Odinga calls for a mass protest today, Monday, for Kenyans to show their displeasure with last year's election results. Liberia begins voter registration today, Monday, as the opposition sues the Elections Commission. Final results in last Saturday's governorship elections in Nigeria trickle in. Malawi intensifies the search for victims of Cyclone Freddy. Hopes are very faint that those that have been counted as missing could be found alive. So efforts have been intensified to search for those. And today, March 20th, is the 20th anniversary of the U.S.-Iraq war. Those stories, plus something O'Malley sports, are coming up on Daybreak Africa. South Africa, the Economic Freedom Fighters EFF Party of Julius Malema has called for a national shutdown today, Monday, to protest the country's ongoing power crisis and rising unemployment. The police say the protest is an attempt to overthrow the government of President Cyril Ramaphosa. Professor Sipo Sipi is a former deputy vice chancellor for institutional support at the University of Zululand. He tells me that the EFF is doing exactly what a political party is supposed to do, agitate for the concerns of its supporters. They are trying to up the ante in our political space. And that is within the context of a number of things that have happened. One, as you know, last year we had a story that broke that had to do with Palapala. And that story, the president had been diving and diving instead of coming out to tell the truth. And then parliament decided to put a panel together to look into the matter. And the panel consisted of the former chief justice and another retired judge and the senior counsel. These are very experienced jurists, and they all came with the conclusion that the president has a case to answer and that he may have violated the constitution and also may have been guilty of a certain serious violations. Then the second thing has to do with the economy. We have been battling with the ESCOM, and uh, what it has meant is that South Africans have been uh, almost uh, subjected to rolling blackouts. And the people that the president had deployed, and he had also been responsible for that, had actually failed this money. As a result, there has been that load shedding has been consequential in the sense that many small businesses collapsed, but many other businesses, big ones, were also not able to do any work. Does the EFF have permission to hold this nationwide protest? I'm saying this because the police have. Uh said that the protest is an attempt to overthrow the Ramaphosa government. The Democratic Alliance, the main opposition in this country, went to court. This matter was entertained by two courts, which both high courts uh, ruled that the protest is uh, one of the rights that citizens have. But what the courts also expect is that the leadership of the EFF will desist from any form of looting or calling for violence and all that. And the issue of the police, it is what the police are expected to do, that whenever these laws are broken, the police or law enforcement agents must do their work. And in a sense, as we speak, both courts said there is nothing wrong in the EFF calling for a mass protest. Professor Sipo Sipi is a political analyst and former deputy vice chancellor for institutional support at the University of Zululand. He was speaking with us from Johannesburg, South Africa. Kenyan opposition leader Raila Odinga has called for a mass protest today, Monday, for Kenyans to show their displeasure with what he says is going on in the country and to claim victory. Odinga lost last August election to current President William Ruto, according to the Electoral Commission and the Supreme Court of Kenya. The police say the protest will be illegal because Odinga did not get enough notice. 
Salim Loom is a former spokesperson for Raila Odinga. He tells me that the protest is the only option to confront what he calls Kenya's growing walls and deepening impoverishment. The essence of the protest is that the last election in which the vice president, Ruto, was declared the winner was so deeply flawed. And in fact, the Electoral Commission, the majority of the members of the Electoral Commission rejected the notion that Ruto had won. And yet he was declared the winner. And the Supreme Court ruled unanimously on all nine points that the election petition was dismissed. And the court also warned lawyers never again to submit any fraudulent submission for petition. And Raila Odinga's message was very simple to President Ruto. Please open the servers because the servers contain the correct results of the election. And that has not been done to date. And of course, it will not be done uh, willingly by Mr. Ruto. So this protest initially called to demand the opening of the servers now has mushroomed into something much bigger. There are those who think that uh, Mr. Odinga is living in denial after losing the election last year and is now trying to force his way into power. Well, I'm glad you asked me this question. Mr. Odinga has lost, in quotes, the last four elections in Kenya. The fact that he's leading it after having lost four elections should not be the issue. The issue is, is what he's saying a legitimate point? The Kenyan police are saying that Monday's protest does not meet the requirement of the so-called Public Order Act, which requires the people trying to demonstrate to inform authorities at least yes. three days before their protest. You know, it is very easy for governments who do not like protests to claim A, B, and C. Mr. Odinga has announced where the protest will start from, and it is publicly known what they are going to do peacefully. They want to present a petition to State House. And if you go by what the police says, you will never come to any basic consensus because the police job is to carry out the orders of the government in power. The government in power is determined to prevent this protest from happening. But the outpouring of support for this protest has been marked by so many large demonstrations all over Kenya. Salim Loam is a former spokesperson for Raila Odinga. He was speaking with us from Princeton, New Jersey. Authorities in Malawi say they have intensified their search for victims of Cyclone Freddy, which hit several regions of the country a week ago. This, as President Lastro Chakwera has been touring the affected regions. Information Minister Moses Konkuyu says the latest casualty figures are 447 confirmed dead and 918 injured. He tells me that while the search is continuing, hopes are fading that those who have been presumed missing would be found alive. As of now, we are still making efforts to recover bodies. I will call it bodies because hopes are very faint that those that have been counted as missing could be found alive. So efforts have been intensified to search for those but also much attention has been given to caring for those that have been evacuated to some safer ground. So basically, at the moment, the country is in that uh, kind of a situation where we are ensuring that those that are in camps are being taken care of. But an update on the numbers of those that we have lost, confirmed bodies that have been found have now risen to 447 with 918 injured, and we are still trying to account for 282 who have been reported missing. In terms of the relief effort, are you getting any assistance, international assistance? As of now, yes, there has been an inflow of uh, aid from uh, various organizations in terms of uh, foodstuffs and uh, sanitary equipment as well as uh, water treatment equipment. We have received foodstuffs from the Republic of Zambia, but also we have received assistance in terms of uh, helicopters that have landed from the Republic of Tanzania, but also the Republic of Zambia has helped us in that regard. 
but also the Republic of Mozambique has come in. So I can say the neighbors have come to our rescue. The same has been the case with our Zimbabwean brothers and sisters. They have also come to our rescue. But mostly many organizations, both locally and internationally, are coming to assist in whatever more way that they can. The president has been touring all the regions that have been affected because mainly it's the southern region and the eastern part of Malawi where 14 districts have been recorded to have uh, been hit. So the president has been to all these regions. He's just left the eastern region as we are speaking, where he has appreciated the extent of the devastation, and he has repeated his call for more aid to be given to Malawi because the problem is very big and we need more food as well as uh, camping equipment, but also many other forms of services like skills in the recovery of the bodies that are missing so that they can be given a decent burial. Thank you so much, Minister. Thank you very much, sir. Moses Konku, you is Malawi's Information Minister. He was speaking with us from the Malawi capital, Lilongwe. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on The Voice of America. I am James Butt in Washington. Today is Monday, March 20th, and still to come on our program, Something O'Malley Sports. The collaborating political parties, or the CPP in Liberia, have filed a lawsuit against the National Elections Commission for attempting to violate the country's constitution. The National Elections Commission, or NEC as it is called, is expected to begin its nationwide voter registration exercise today, March 20th. The CPP says the lawsuit filed at the Supreme Court is intended to stop the elections body from conducting voter registration in constituencies that are yet to be reapportioned to reflect population growth determined by the country's 2022 national census. Rita Jalabwe Duo reports from Monrovia. According to provisional results from the 2022 National Census, Liberia's population is at 5.2 million people, an increase of 1.7 million from the 2008 census count of 3.5 million. Article 80E of the Liberian Constitution requires that, immediately following a national census and before the next elections, the Elections Commission shall reapportion the constituencies in accordance with the new population figures so that every constituency shall have as close to the same population as possible, provided, however, that a constituency must be solely within a county. The National Elections Commission, or NEC, announced that it will begin a nationwide voter registration exercise today, March 20. But the collaborating political parties, also known as the CPP, has petitioned the Supreme Court of Liberia to mandate the elections governing body to proceed as the Constitution commands in Article 80. Opposition parties also alleged that the NEC is violating the Constitution, which guarantees every citizen the right to be registered and to vote only in the constituency where they are registered. The CPP says it is worried that if the NEC is allowed to conduct the voter registration without adhering to the Constitution, there might be several other violations, including the timely conduct of the elections. In its petition, the group highlights that the violations are significant and overlooking them could have serious implications for the country. The CPP meanwhile clarifies that its action is not intended to delay the October 10th general and presidential elections, but to prevent a violation that could possibly compromise the integrity of the electoral process. Neither the NEC nor the Supreme Court has responded to the petition. For VOA Africa, I'm Rita Jdobwe-Duo in Morovia. Results from Saturday's Nigeria governorship and state assembly elections are trickling in from 28 of the country's 36 states. Going into the polls, the ruling All Progressive Congress Party, the APC, had governance in 21 states, while the main opposition People's Democratic Party, the PDP, had 14. As journalist Medina Dauda of Views Hausa Language Service tells us from Abuja, the country's Independent National Elections Commission, also known as INEC, has announced the final results 
results of the vote in six states. So far, I have six governorship candidates that have been declared by IMF out of the 28 that contested. We had elections in 28 states of Nigeria because the other eight states, the governors in those eight states are not ready to vacate yet. So of the results you have, we know the two leading political parties, which of those two, the APC or the PDP, have won the most uh, governorship contest so far? Well, I have here six state governors that won, and most of them are old governors that have now retained their seat. And so far, I have four APC and two PDP governors. Now, uh, Lagos State is won by APC, and the incumbent, Governor Babajide Olushola Sanwolu, has just won a second term. Medina, going into the elections on Saturday, there were high hopes that there were too many female candidates particularly for governorship. What do you know about the females who contested? Any results so far? Well, um, I know that uh, before now, there were 10 female governorship candidates and uh, 24 running mates who emerged to contest the 2023 general elections, uh, James. But as we are speaking with you, still have not received any confirmation or any state that has been won by a female governor. I know that there's one female governor of APC that contested in Adamawa State, which her her candidature was highly celebrated because she's a sitting senator from Adamawa State, Aisha Ahiru Binani. But as we speak with you, the INEC in Adamawa has not collated all the results of the local government. The results of three local governments are being awaited before a winner is declared. Medina, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bati. That was journalist Medina Dauda of the US Hausa Language Service speaking with us from Abuja, Nigeria. Today, March 20th, is the 20th anniversary of the U.S.-Iraq War. Ellen Lyson is the director of the Security Policy Studies Program at George Mason University. She tells viewers and counter-host Carol Castillo that former President George W. Bush's major motivation for invading Iraq was fear and a desire to prevent another 9-11, despite no empirical evidence connecting Saddam Hussein to al-Qaeda. Melvin Leffler, a very distinguished emeritus professor at the University of Virginia, has now come out with a new book arguing that, first of all, Bush was in charge. He was not being manipulated by his advisors and that his primary motivation was fear and the strong desire to prevent another 9-11. How that got transferred onto Iraq is obviously, there's a lot of analytic flaws and incorrect assumptions, etc. That's one interpretation. But we know that in the public discourse, and I would still hold the Bush administration responsible for making arguments to the public to win support for what they were about to do, you can't take away that it was about the freedom agenda. There had been success of democratization in Eastern Europe, and there was a belief that somehow the Middle East, if we could just peel off, remove the worst of the dictators, that somehow there'd be this rush towards democratic culture in the Middle East, and the WMD question where we didn't want to believe the answers that the UN was giving us, that these programs were dormant, that there really wasn't any active production of weapons of mass destruction. So I don't give them a pass on trying to make both the democracy and the WMD argument. My colleague Ahsen Butt has written to me what might be a very compelling way to think about this, which is that 9-11 truly was the trauma. It truly was the organizing motivation for everybody in the Bush team, whether you were a neocon ideologue or something else, but that it was an instinctive desire to demonstrate that the United States still had dominant power, that we could deter and intimidate any other actor from don't you dare do what al-Qaeda did. And so it was this desire to kind of reassert American hegemony. The irony and the tragedy of it all is that by doing so, we actually brought an end to the period of the single superpower, that the Iraq war had such tragic consequences that it really was an end of an era of American supremacy, not the continuation of it. 
That was Professor Ellen Leibson, Director of the Security Policy Studies Program at George Mason University. She spoke with viewers and counter program host Carol Castile. <music> It is time now for Daybreak Africa Sports, and here is Samson Omale in Abuja, Nigeria. A very good Monday morning to you, Samson. Good Monday morning to you too, Jim. Rwanda Energy Group Basketball Club tasted their first Basketball Africa League Bal 2023 defeat in the Sahara Conference after they were beaten by Stad Malian 64-84 on Saturday at Dakar Arena. Prior to the game, REG had already qualified for the playoffs that will take place in Kigali in May after winning three conference games in a row. Saturday's game was not only the second win for Stad Malian in four games, but a major boost for the Malians who are pushing for their first playoffs in May in Kigali. Zambia coach Avram Grant says the door is open for any Zambian player who has quality, passion and the will to fight for the Chipolopolo jersey. Grant says he wants to build a winning team for the Chipolopolo who are trying to recover from three successive AFCON qualification flops. Speaking during a media engagement ahead of the back-to-back AFCON 2023 qualifiers against Lesotho to be played on the 24th and the 26th of March 2023, Coach Grant agreed that the marches will be difficult. They need to prove themselves, and who will prove himself will stay in the squad. And who will prove himself in the league, in any league that he's playing, also the door is open for him. And I want to tell you that it was very difficult after our three days with the local players. I enjoyed it very much. It was very difficult to choose between the self. Even the players that I choose in their position, there is a player that the difference is not so big. Staying with football news, CAF has confirmed that the 45th CAF Ordinary General Assembly schedule for the 13th of July 2023 will be hosted by Benin Republic. This is the first CAF Ordinary Assembly to be hosted in the Benin capital, Cotonou. Previously, Benin hosted the 2021 CAF Confederations Cup between Algeria's GS Kabile and Raja Club Athletic of Morocco. In table tennis news, Africa's top-ranked player, Arna Quadri's brilliant run at the World Table Tennis Singapore Smash came to an end at the weekend following a 4-0 loss to Brazilian Hugo Cadernaro. The quarterfinals game played at the Infinity Arena saw the Nigerians succumb 11-7, 12-10, 11-2, 11-2 to Cadernaro. This ends the journey at the tournament for Africa's top player, having earlier defeated Japanese Tomokazu Harimoto, 3 love in the round of 16. In mixed martial art news, Britain's Leon Edwards retained his welterweight title in front of his home fans as he beat Nigerian Kamaru Usman by majority decision at the UFC 286 in London. The victory over Usman sees Edwards make his first title defense since beating the Nigerian in August 2022. Kamaru Usman had entered the octagon looking to rebound from his title loss to Leon Edwards this past August. That setback, which was a brutal head kick knockout, had marked Usman's second career defeat and his first loss since 2013. And that's it for this Monday's edition of Daybreak Africa Sports. I am Samson Omale in Abuja, Nigeria. It's back to you, James, in Washington. Thank you, Samson. Have a very good Monday. And that's it for this Monday, March 20th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for beginning your week with us. For more Africa news and